Good evening. For those who have not yet found their way to the uh, snack table, please pass by there on your way to the seats. Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to have you here at Church of the Crossroads. Uh, I am Reverend Kyle Lovett, and on behalf of the entire congregation, I want to welcome you here. It is so good to have a follow-up event to the Umimatsu and Yasu Watada lectures, which we just hosted a couple of weeks ago, the beginning of November, on the topic of militarization in the Pacific. And how fortunate that we have uh, peace activists who are in the community and who uh, stepped forward to bring us information not just about uh, Jeju and um, their experiences there, but also to really enlighten us about how life-changing that contact was for them. So thank you all for being here. A uh, little piece of, uh, of uh, housekeeping. The bathrooms are out that back door past the exit sign. Uh, men's room is to the right. Women's is sort of straight ahead to the left. Um, and if you have electronic devices that beep or buzz or ring, I invite you to put them on vibrate as we begin. So again, on behalf of Church of the Crossroads and the entire community here and uh, uh, Hawaii Peace and Justice and the, the communities that have come together to present this post-Watada uh, lecture, welcome. So I want to introduce uh, Kristen Douglas, who is going to, who is one of the folk who has uh, traveled to Jeju Island who's going to tell us a little bit and then introduce our main speaker. Kristen. Thank you, Reverend Kyle. Um, my name is Kristen, and um, a little over a year ago, um, well, actually in March of this year, um, bombing the coast of Jeju Island, which is a small island off of the uh, southern tip of South Korea. Um, bombing began, um, which is the beginning of the uh, construction of uh, a naval base that is being built there by the Republic of Korea in conjunction with the United States. Um, the United States is pushing for this naval base um, because it uh, wants to contain China. And the people of Jeju do not want this naval base. Um, if it is allowed to uh, reach completion, it will devastate, it will completely consume uh, one of the last traditional villages um, on the island. Um, the people of the uh, people in Jeju and Gangjong, which is the uh, small uh, village whose coast is being devastated uh, ecologically um, by the bombing and by the uh, construction of the naval base. They have actually had no say in uh, whether or not this naval base will or would uh, begin to be built or not. Uh, they were duped immensely. Um, they are bitter. Uh, they have not forgotten the uh, Korean War. They have not forget, forgotten the devastation of the of their occupation by Japan, and uh, and what that brought to their and took from their lives. Um, I was asked to go and witness uh, what was taking place there, and I had no idea what I was going to experience. And when I got there, what I witnessed uh, has become a life changing experience for me. Um, the human rights violations, the devastation of already endangered species, which will become extinct if this naval base is allowed to reach completion, um, are all taking place. I've witnessed police being uh, kicking, shoving, lifting, throwing uh, priests and nuns, young activists, young peace activists. Um, I've witnessed police referring to the young activists as trash, as dogs. Um, I've witnessed police destroying the art of the activists. And um, I'm going to turn you over to tonight's key speaker. <laughs> I could go on and on and on. 
I would like to say while you're listening to, to, uh, to Kuhan um, that what is needed most are in the village are people. Um, they need your presence. They need your presence to, to witness. They need your presence to come back and talk and share about what is going on there because it is insight into what is happening and the course that we are all headed in um, in the world. Uh, what is happening in Gangjong is history in the making. It's a war in the making. Um, it will become yet another United States uh, military outpost um, in the quest for the United States domination. And it is um, part and parcel to the uh, uh, current administration in this country's um, pivot toward the Asian Pacific. And what is beginning to happen in Gangjong uh, is not at all unlike what happened here on this island. Um, so if you can go, that would be fantastic. If you cannot go, if you have a community that you could maybe gather funds and, and uh, sponsor someone to go or host someone that's, that, that can go, um, please, please do so. It is such a, it's such a moral boost um, for uh, for the activists who have been just doing this day and night uh, for the past seven years. So with that, um, I'll turn you over to um, Kuhan Pak, who is, um, maybe you know her writings. Uh, she is the author of the Super, Chrono Super Fairy Chronicles. There are copies on the table. Um, she has written extensively and spoken extensively um, of what's going on in Gangju and single-handedly engineered the hijacking of the world <laughs> of IUCN's WCC conference, which was held in Jeju this summer. So I applaud you and thank you for coming. Thanks, Kristen, and thank you all, each and every one of you for showing up because this is such an important topic for people in the Pacific. And I mean, it's evident once you st I start talking why it's important. And we need to get the word out to people in North America because we're sort of like, like off the radar screen. Um, also, I, I really want to thank Rennie Lindley for bringing me over because she kept saying, you should come over and do a speech. I'm like, you pay for everything and I'm there. So here I am. Because I, I actually, I spent all, I emptied my bank account to go to Kangjong two visits um, in the past four or five months. And um, the first visit, I used my frequent flyer miles, and 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 then I, I and then I was hooked. And also, um, sort of like the World Conservation Congress, which was the IUCN International Conference, International Con International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is a huge international, it's the largest and oldest and most prestigious international environmental organization. They're based in Switzerland and they had their huge four, a quadrennial conference four miles away from Kangjung Village. So I had to come back for that. Um, but I want to, how many people know about the Kangjung um, struggle so I can know like how much to go over? Okay, and how many people know zero about the Kangjung struggle? Okay, so um, let me first talk about, oh, also, I want to thank Reverend Kyle because every time I come to Cross, Church of the Crossroads, I have a really good experience. And the first time I ever heard of it was from Joseph Gerson, who runs AFSC in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And he is such uh, an important towering figure in the demilitarization of the world and the Pacific. And so he told me that during the Vietnam War, he had a connection with people, um, uh, conscientious objectors in Hawaii who were hanging out here and he was connected to them. So, and then we did our Moana Nui conference here last year. And um, so, and here I am today. So thank you, Reverend Kyle, for all your good work. Um, oh, also I wanna say that on that table there is pieces of paper that you can sign one person per paper to say no to the Osprey helicopters to be stationed here. And it's sort of funny, it was kind of a surprise because originally they were supposed to go to Guam, all of them, 
And the people of Guam rose up and said, um, have you really studied the environmental impacts of this? Because they threw, away, they threw together an EIS that was completely just thrown together, put together by an outsourced company of an outsourced company of an outsourced company, people who had never been to Guam writing what the environmental impacts would be. And when senators went there, they realized this is completely not feasible. And because the people rose up and spoke, now we have the Ospreys. <laughs> and Okinawa, and they're going to be rotating, and um, where else? Does anyone else know? Well, anyway, it's sort of like rearranging the deck furniture on the Titanic. And ideally, it'd be great if we could just say, we want to solve problems not through ever-increasing military, but maybe through dialogue. So, um, also, there's copies of my book that I co-wrote with my husband, Jerry Mander, called The Super Fairy Chronicles. And Gong Chung, I kept getting so reminded of the super fairy boondoggle as I watch this um, base struggle, the struggle against the base, and these two huge opposing forces, which are, in both cases, the um, corporations in cahoots with government and people. And most of, the, most of the time in those struggles, the corporations and government are just so much stronger than the people. But every now and then, the people are super strong because so many different groups come together and form a huge coalition. And so that's how Super Fairy um, was defeated. And that might be the way we hope that the Gangjong based struggle will, will um, win. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so if you would like to give a donation to HPJ, Hawaii Peace and Justice, you'll get a free book, The Super Fairy Chronicles. And is there anything else? Also, um, there's newsletters and stuff you can pick up. So, okay, let me talk about Cheju. How did I first find out about it? Well, Cheju, who here is Korean? Okay. So pe Korean people, for Korean people, Chejido is like, I wouldn't say it's like the Hawaii of Korea, though Koreans always call it that, because the, it, it's so much more ancient and in the way back consciousness and the fact that the agriculture was so fertile and the, and the water was so pure and the, the, um, a lot of the cultural traditions in terms of music go back, ancient and pre-Confucius patri matriarchy was there. Genghis Khan trained his horsemen there in about 1200. There's been civilization there for 4,000 years. So to say it's the Hawaii of Korea is so superficial. It's not only is it a tropical paradise, quote unquote, where they have the most dense population of UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the world, but, you know, very beautiful, subtropical, but it's also very, very culturally um, important. It's where you might have heard of the Henyo, um, which are the lady oyster divers that dive down into the coral reefs and pick the abalone and the octopus and they go fishing that way, and that's sort of linked with the matriarchal society. Um, they were the ones who taught the Japanese oyster diver ladies how to do it. And um, a lot of Korean culture was passed on to Japan um, because it started in China and then it moved east. And that's what one of the things I think is so tragic about this base is the base is really these people's home is being used as the front lines by global superpowers, in this case the United States, to make themselves a target against their um, heritage, their forefathers, I mean the country from which all their heritage comes. And already the division of North and South Korea has divided the souls of every single Korean because everybody is North Korean and South Korean, every Korean. It's no, I mean, South Korea is only the size of Indiana and yet there's over 100 military bases, American, and then there are also, um, there are also uh, South Korean military bases. But PACCOM, which is Pacific Command here, 
in Honolulu controls the entire hemisphere. And it goes all the way from, let's see, it's like the Indian Ocean to the Americas, and then Antarctica, or Alaska down to Antarctica. It covers 51% of the planet. 3,500 languages are spoken in this area. 52 nations. And in November of last year, I went to um, a speech in San Francisco by Admiral Willard, who is the guy who runs PATCOM. And the name of the speech was Protecting the Commons. And the idea was this hemisphere of the nation that takes up over half the population was a commons and a protectorate by the United States. That was the gist of the, of the speech. <sighs> um, the South Korean military is fully controlled by PATCOM. So what was interesting was uh, most Koreans don't know that and most people don't know that. And, um, and so when I was there, um, a lot of the pro-base people were saying, no, we need this base for our sovereignty. This is for South Korean sovereignty. And, I, and they would ask me, reporters would come up and they'd say, don't you care about South Korean sovereignty? And I said, South Korean sovereignty will begin when you get rid of the mutual defense treaty between the United States and South Korea, which says that the South Korean military is subordinate to Pacific Command in Honolulu. They had no idea that that existed. I don't actually think they understood my English, but um, I gave it a try. Okay, so how did I find out about Jeju? When I was um, nine years old, in 1970 or 69, um, I had just moved to Korea from LA, which was very traumatic because at the time Korea was the poorest nation in the world and we lived pretty comfortably in, in LA. And, and, but my father was Korean and we wanted to move back to Korea. And um, I had like, you know, I was coming from the age of Aquarius and, and my, my boy cousins were like, you need to go to Jeju Island, you're too bossy. Because they weren't used to girls that were like, thought they were equal to boys. And I'm like, Jeju Island? He goes, yeah, that's Woman's Island. I'm like, oh, okay. That's, so I always stuck in my head, like that seems really cool. And then later I learned about Genghis Khan as I, as I got involved in horsemanship. And then I thought, oh, I've got to go to this island. But the thing that finally brought me there was, um, uh, I, th two or three years ago, I saw some blog from Sung Hee Choi, who's with Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, talking about how people, like this 72-year-old man, like went into a coma after being beat up by police because he was um, trying to, he was protesting this announcement that a base was going to be built. And it was on Jeju Island, this island that I'd heard about for so long. I'm like, oh, well, I guess it's been 40 some odd years. I better go now. I never went when I was a little kid. So I went, my first time was in June of this year. And um, I want to just start showing some pictures. Okay, this is, I just threw this in here because we could get the lights. Oh, oh. This is, um, oh. So I lived in Kauai until two months ago, and I lived there for, hold on, okay, f for um, 20 years, and, and as you may or may not know, Kauai is home to the world's largest missile testing range, Pacific Range Missile Facility, which is actually leased. It's actually like leased by the military to um, Lockheed Martin who manufactures Aegis missiles. Now, the, um, the base in Jeju is being built specifically to house Aegis missiles. And um, last, this was in late August of last year. I, this picture was on the cover of the, um, of the Garden Island newspaper. Gosh, it's so high contrast. I don't, it's showing up much nicer on my computer. Hold on. Now I made it worse. But, okay, we'll just have to live with that. But um, 
you can see Inoue's on the far right. And what, what this is, this is a, a, a celebration, and it's a very reverent celebration in, in at PMRF where um, Aletha Kauhi, who, who I've worked with on indigenous issues, is giving a gourd filled with soil from a section of PMRF that they are now building into a new test range for Aegis land missiles. And they just got about $58 million to, to build this, and so this is a celebration. And she's giving, giving the umeke full of the soil to um, Captain Mongilo, who runs PMRF, and you can see, um, and she's the most respected kupuna in one of the most, she's a direct descendant of Prince Kuhio. And you can see, uh, what's his name, Inoue on the right, looking very guilty, but like when I saw this picture, I just, I just freaked out because I, it, 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 I, just, I, I just couldn't think of anything more disgusting than the way the whole thing was set up and staged and people looking like they're praying and everyone, at, I mean, there's such a quality, a religious quality to it. And then like the, the henchman over here, in a way, who, who like rigged it. And of course, um, this is all for Lockheed. And do, I don't know if you know, but for the past, ever since 2001, ever since 9-11, the number one campaign contributor to Inoue has been Lockheed Martin. They also, like I said, lease PMRF, and they're the ones building the Aegis missiles. And the Jeju base is specifically being built to house Aegis missiles pointed at China, which is 300 miles away, and also going to be the home very close by of their air, new aircraft carrier, which has just recently been built. So anyway, that was sad, and I became feeling more connected to Jeju now because my home had this complicity with everything that uh, went against my sense of justice. And then the next day, this was going on in Jeju Island. People were protesting the base and there was a huge crackdown. And I got an email from a friend who was there saying, oh my God, so many people got arrested, so many people got um, beat up. And this was, uh, before they used to, when I was there, they started doing all the protests in front of the new base construction. But this was before the base construction started, and this was at a crossroads, the access road to where the base construction was gonna be. So that, that was like a so in my face <sighs> blogger jam it, for me. Uh, I, just, I just had to, do everything I could to go. So I, I managed to get enough frequent flyer miles and it took me a whole year, but I got there. But in the meantime, I started talking about it to everyone. And people who had money that were friends went, like my friend Imok Cha, who um, is a physician in, in San Francisco, and Christine An, and et cetera. So that was good, I just got the word out. Okay, so let's just look at some pictures, or actually, Yeah, I wanted to talk about like what was really um, startling for me was when I, before all of this happened and somebody talked about missile defense, for me it was super, Star Wars was very abstract and I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know how that impacted us or if that made a difference. It was just things crash into the sky and or, you know, they shoot something off of, uh, you know, Vanderberg and then it goes to Kwajalein and gets intercepted in Kauai or in Kwajalein and boom, it disappears and we never see it and nothing, no, no problem, right? Well, this really, I mean, I knew about the Marshall Islands and I knew these tests were going on and I was terrible, I'm, I'm horribly offended by what's gone on in Ebai where they moved all the people off Kwajalein where they have turned it into like a huge missile base and then all, that's like the most densely populated, um, impoverished place on the planet, this little tiny island where all these people with no trees or anything and it's very radioactive and, and they just, live there so that they can do this missile testing. So I, I knew that and, I knew, and 
that's uh, horrified me. And but I didn't. This was really interesting because it showed me how the infrastructure is very destructive to all of this super high tech stuff. Because what you have to do, not only is it the base, but then you have to have housing for the people, and then you have to have. Home Depot for the housing for the people. And then all the while you're doing practice, right? You're doing military practice and then new arms are being developed and then those new ones, you gotta practice on them too. And then, and, and, and so it's really like this updating of, upgrading of all of these um, armaments is just, it's just this in, infinite cycle on a planet where we only have so much environment and so much land that we can give in to total destruction because people are practicing and because we want to be secure just in case something happens. And I thought, oh, this is insane because especially like recently, I keep track of stuff in the Mariana Islands because I used to live in Guam and um, they're having they're, they're gonna turn one million square miles of the open Pacific into practice range, going from, going from Palau to the Mariana Islands. One million square miles. They had one scoping meeting because there's no, there's, there's, it's just open ocean, so they don't even have to like get an okay. And, and so it's like, who's gonna speak for the, all of the marine animals and, and everything? I mean, it's bad enough where you know we, we can talk about what's going on in terms of the, the sonar and the dolphins and the whales and everything, but then there's so much stuff that's going on that there's no accountability whatsoever. So what does missile defense look like? Well, Kong Jung is what missile, how missile defense impacts people on the ground. And um, one thing that was very interesting was that, um, well, let, let me talk a little bit about the Jeju history briefly the Tamna people, uh, it used to be called Tamna Island, and the Tamna people still live there, but what's interesting is because they haven't really been politicized as an indigenous people, like there's not that kind of consciousness at all. They're just like, yeah, we're Tamna, whatever, and they don't think of themselves uh, think of that as being a political tool that can be used in the UN. So what was really awesome about this World Congress, uh, Conservation Congress, is that people from the UN, indigenous people from there, were going, you guys gotta, you know, like start, start putting t out information about Tomna, literature about Tomna, um, you know, start documenting your Tomna-ness. And, and so they, that was really great for them. Um, they've been around f since, well, the Tamna Kingdom was documented to start around the first century, but there's been civilization in Kangzhang for 4,000 4, years, and um, then it was subsumed by Korea in 900, but still, it always retained um, its own language um, that is a dialect of Korean that Korean people can't understand, but it has um, more e equitability, like between men and women and rank. It's much more equitable language. And um, uh, I forgot what I was, but anyway, it's, it's, it's very interesting history. And then, and of course, it's a, and it's a volcanic island and, vol and, and rocks are really important. Like here, the, it reminds me, it was so funny because <laughs> My friend Emo, who had just come back from Kangzheng, we went, had a Moana Nui conference over at the UH um, Hawaiian Studies Center, and she likes, like, oh, this is just like Cheju, this is just like Cheju, and I'm like, it's, it's so Hawaii, like all the lava rocks everywhere, and for someone to go, oh, I love it, it's just like Cheju, it's just like, there's, there's like an, there's a affinity. Um, when I got there and when Kristen got there also, people were always asking us what Hawaii was like, is the base gonna be a good thing because Hawaii's hugely militarized. It, it's been good for Hawaii to have the base, right? And they always very, were very curious because the woman who's now running for president, which will be determined in an election on December 19th, her name is Pak Gun Hye. She's the daughter of the notorious dictator Pak Chung Hee, who was assassinated because he was 
notoriously brutal to people that rose up against the corporate structure that they were at that time nurturing after the destruction of the Korean War had leveled, had leveled the nation. So it's super mixed because on the one hand, people aren't starving or homeless anymore. And on the other hand, there were so many civil rights massively violated, people killed for no reason because they spoke out. And, um, and it just shows how poor and struggling the country was that people are willing to sort of elect her because, well, now we can eat. Um, and the, the trade that took place that was nurtured by the Korean government, of course, was um, implemented by the United States because the, the peninsula, it was, had been divided and that was during the time of the Cold War where it was communism versus capitalism, right? So we were, America was going to get a lot of trade in there. And now it's kind of an obsolete concept, the Cold War. It's the only place where the Cold War still exists, but it does exist. And if you're a South Korean or anyone who talks about North Korea is kind of looked at like a kook if you're not vilifying it. Um, it's just the stigma that the media has um, blanketed us with. I'm not saying North Korea is perfect, but I'm telling you, South Korea sucks just as bad, and you'll see why. <laughs> so here's a few pictures to show you what Gangjung Village looks like. You can see the lava. This is a very traditional house, and actually, Kristen, a lot of, I don't know if you're aware, but the thatches, um, that you know how they were the um, roofs covered in plastic? Underneath the plastic were the thatches. I don't know if you're aware, but um, now they, they, it's so ugly. They cover them with thatches to protect them from the elements so they don't have to change them as much. And, and so now it looks like, doesn't look like this. They took the thatch off for the picture, the plastic off the thatch, but it's like a plastic hair bonnet. It looks super bad. Um, but anyway, and gardens everywhere, and lava rock walls everywhere, and so much, so many, so ma it's so sustainable. It's like the perfect sustainable society. It's like what we're all supposed to be, like what we read about in the eco-friendly news. This is like how we're supposed to be, and we're destroying it. One of the few places, okay. And then rooftops, and lava rock walls everywhere, and tangerine trees everywhere more tangerine groves. This is across the street from the mayor's office. And um, I love this picture because it looks like Kona, right? But all throughout this rocky coastline that they call Gurumbi, that's their name for it, it's the Gurumbi. The, it's about a mile long and the Gurumbi coastline is exactly where the base is going to be. And all throughout the Gurumbi is freshwater pools of some of the purest water in the world, you can drink this water that he's swimming in. Now, the way these freshwater pools come up is it rains on top of Mount Hala, which is the volcanic mountain that gave birth to this island. And then, now, somebody told me, um, Mi Kyung told me, and she's, um, an enthusiastically anti-base Tomna person who I love. She's totally fun and she runs a women's um, battered shelter clinic. But anyway, you might see a picture of her. But anyway, she, um, she said that it takes one century for the time between the rainwater hits the ground and comes up from uh, um, as pools. Now, I, I really have a hard time believing that and I really need to check that out. So as a journalist, I'm just putting a footnote, let's fact check that, but that's what I heard. And if that's so, that's like a century of lava filtering. And also, I, I looked up this lava. This lava, it's not basalt lava, which is what we have here. It's andesite lava. Andesite lava is the kind of lava that has the, uh, uh, it starts with a Z, and they used to sell these little drops of it for $35 in a bottle. And then you take it, and then it, it cleanses you. Um, I'll think of it later. But anyway, like the fact that it's being filtered through that just blew my mind. In the distance, you see Tiger Island. It's a sacred island. Well, the whole island is sacred. 
but this particular island is officially sacred because it is a UNESCO biosphere reserve. And in this area, it's also a Korean national monument because there are so many species of soft coral. There are, in the 70s or 80s, some species, and uh, so many other things. Dolphins, it's the only place in Korea with dolphins. There are only 100 left. Of course, the base will kill all this, and what's really interesting is the fact of how many dolphins, or that even there were dolphins, and also the fact that the coral was there, had been um, kept a secret because they didn't want the Korean people to know. In fact, they still don't know. And the reason why we know is because my friend Emok from San Francisco, I couldn't believe this. She put together, she got like, within four weeks, she found $30,000 funding from Greenpeace. She found three biologists to travel to Jeju and do studies of the coral, the frogs, the shrimp, the crabs, and the dolphins. And then she published the reports. And then she was on her way to the World Conservation Congress in September to present these findings, to show to the world this is one of the most amazing places. She found out that this is one of the largest and most diverse spectacular soft coral reefs in the world, 15 acres, totally intact. Nothing else exists like it at this northerly latitude. Nobody knew that. Nobody knew that. But they deported her at the airport so she couldn't make the presentation. She got to the, I was waiting for her. Where are you? I'm writing emails at three in the morning. I didn't hear back. Then the next like four or five in the morning, I get an email. I've been deported. I just got to see, back to Seattle. They, as soon as I got to Incheon, as soon as I went to the customs, they took me in a back room, hand printed me, foot printed me, took my picture, made fun of me, and sent me on the last, on the next plane to North America. And then she had to transfer from Seattle to San Francisco. And she was totally crying. That was in September. She's not allowed to enter the country again. Her parents are 90, they live here, there. She can never visit her parents again. They're too old to travel. Why can she never visit? Did she do anything wrong? Well, she was about to expose all of these natural wonders that are going to be destroyed, and the Korean government put a stop to that. And I might add, the Korean government is very tight with Samsung and Hyundai, because remember what I was saying about how um, Park Chung-hye um, killed anyone that went up against the development, the hyper-development of South Korea. So those people are very, very connected. Um, government is, uh, is indistinguishable from um, corporations in Korea. And, and um, because of the heavy militarization of Korea, all those companies are moving into becoming the leading arms manufacturers in the world. For example, Samsung has a partnership with Thales in France, and they produce missiles and sell them to Israel. So, and, and they see that this is, as long as we can keep people nervous about security, we can sell arms. And this is a great way to make a ton of money. And they're doing it. They're just following um, in the footsteps of, of the superpower who created them. So um, anyway, moving right along. You can see more lava formations. This is near the Gurumbi. This is not the actual Gurumbi itself, but it's Gurumbi-like. This is Mount Hala in the summertime. You can see it's a dormant volcano with a lake on the top. And in the winter time. So imagine, here's an island with, it's a small island, it's, gosh, I think it's a bit bigger than Kauai, okay? So that's fairly small, and it's, it, it snows, and yet there's palm trees and a tropical reef. 
It's very unique in the world. Why is there a tropical reef right next to an island that snows? Well, it's because there's something called the Tsushima Current that comes up from south of Taiwan. It's very, very warm. And it, it's very clean, too. And it comes, and it basically kind of comes right to Chejido. And then it also starts to branch off toward uh, Japan, but really it's, it, right there in Jeju is like a really rich place for coral. And because of that, it's got that 15 acre reef. And because of the henyo, the lady sea divers that pick by hand, unlike the tropical reefs in the Philippines and Fiji where they use dynamite to fish, it's perfectly intact. That's why it's such a precious place today is because the traditional um, harvesting and management of the resources preserved it perfectly. And like, as we speak, it's being totally destroyed. Like that freshwater pool is gone. Um, two days ago, there was an oil spill after a tugboat sank. And how did they deal with it? Detergent. Well, if you remember the Gulf spill, detergent disperses it. And one thing about soft coral. Now, hard coral is different because hard coral nourishes itself through symbio symbiosis with sunlight, photosynthesis, and plankton. That's how it feeds itself. Uh, soft coral feeds itself through clean water. It doesn't need light, so it can grow very, very deep beneath the sea. And um, just, just uh, the food, oh, I can't remember what the food is, but Emok told me this, because she's the big scientist. So it needs, oh, flowing water, because the food moves, it needs to move through clean, flowing water, always moving, always flowing and clean. Well, when you've got detergent, like there's the enemy to soft coral is, is, is particles, sediment. Anything that keeps it from, um, it always has to be flushed clean so that it can receive food. And so this is, when I heard this, I was just phew, so bummed out about the detergent in the oil. Okay, here's some water that, this is a spring. It looks like a river and a waterfall, but actually that waterfall in the back is usually not there. This is Nikiriso, right after the, <clears throat> it's a sacred spring that provides the water supply to half of the island, the southern half of the island, and, you sh and it comes up from below. It's, it looks like it's coming from a river above, but actually it just was after a typhoon, so it's totally overflowing. And the typhoon that, it wrecked the base. There was a typhoon in August that wrecked, or no, right after like September 10th, that wrecked the base, and then this was the, what it looked like the day after. And then when the tugboat sank, it sank because it hit a ground, one of the chunks of wrecked base that was underwater that it didn't see. And, and then on top of that, yesterday, like they, this other tugboat, the tugboat's owned by Samsung, and this other tugboat owned by Samsung, they, they're going to pull the tugboat out, right? So they attach a cable, and they're pulling, 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 and it's not going, and it's not going. And then the cable snaps, and it kills one of the workers on the tugboat. That was yesterday. So it really reminds me of Super Furry, because I don't know if you remember that, but remember it had to go into dry dock? Or remember the barge was always breaking in Maui, and then it had to go into dry dock, and they lifted up, and they dropped it, and then there was a big hole punctured through it. <laughs> Do you remember that? It's so much like it. So this is Nikiri, so this is the same spring on a clear day, on a calm day. This is Silver, one of the activists. Tiger Island. The, um, on the right-hand side is where the easternmost pier will jut out, and the tip of the pier will be 0.13 miles from the border of the UNESCO biosphere, and it's two miles to, this, to the UNESCO biosphere, which encircles the island. Here's people, this is before they put the base, they started working on the base and people could go down and get water. This is one of the endangered species of this, of the Gurumbi. One thing about the Gurumbi, there is so much food there. Before they walled off the Gurumbi, they didn't have to go to the store for food. 
there were 86 species of seaweed and how many? I think something in the 50s of shellfish. It might be more. Shellfish I've never seen before. All kinds of shells with little critters inside. Like all different shapes, it's like unbelievable. And um, once I was in the activist um, kitchen area and there's a big pot, because they're always cooking a big soup on the stove and I opened the lid and there was a shell this big in it, cooking. I thought this has got to be an endangered species. I can't believe they're eating this. Anyway, um, this is the first year where the, act, where the villagers are not going to be able to eat from their food source. Now, the Korean government has been saying in their environmental impact statement that there will be, they call it, incidental impacts to the villagers of Gangjung. No, these are very direct impacts. For the first time, these people have to find some money to go to the store and buy some food imported from I don't know, California? I don't know. Anyway, that's the frog that lives there. Here's a henio. Emok took this picture while she was visiting. And there they all, they're hanging out outside of their trade union. Right, free, 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 breath, free diving, yeah, no tanks. And they're like all in their 80s. And here they are, they just like truck on out there and you can see their floats, right? You can tell these aren't Henyo, they're wearing their masks. But you can see the coral, what the coral looks like. Here's an underwater protest. <laughs> coral, coral. There's several, like, gosh, I think four or five CITES species, which is the Convention on International Trade in, Envi in Endangered Species. So these are very, very rare. And as we speak, like I say, they're just perishing. The last hundred dolphins in Korea. See, what the cetacean specialists that came to the conference were blown away. We had no idea there were, there were dolphins. In Korea, it's too northerly for dolphins. And they said, if we had known, we would have totally prepared a presentation on why we need to preserve this area because this is so special. So this is the only pod of dolphins in Korea, and it's the most northerly pod of dolphins in the world. And what, what is the most rare? It's not that rare. Yeah, it's not that rare, actually. I looked it up in my massive research. Oh, she said that it's one of the most rare dolphin species, but it's actually not that rare. This is what is going on. Now. No, no, in Korea, there's only 100 individuals left, but in other parts of the world, it's not rare. They're not rare. This is what the base is gonna look like. See the circle in the middle? That's the turning radius. It's way too small for an aircraft carrier. And the prime minister in February of this year had ordered a study to be done. Um, two people from the Ministry of Defense were part of that and some other people, and they concluded that it's too small. It's too small, but they pushed ahead anyway. And I think the reason they pushed ahead, and I say this only from my experience with Super Ferry, is that don't let environmental law get in the way push through, make the money, please the shareholders for the next fiscal quarter, then go back and change it. Because if they stop then to do another environmental impact statement on a new design, the shareholders are like, hey, or actually this might be a privately owned corporation, but it impedes profit. So even though the government study itself says this is a non-functional base, they're just pushing through. That's what the water looks like now. This is Sung Hee Choi, the woman I told you about from Global Network. She's addicted to texting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Sung Hee, you don't have to tell me everything you're doing all the time. I'm sorry. I've seen this picture so many times that I just start to make jokes, but it actually is a really serious situation. 
which is why I'm here telling you. This, um, that was about, this was about September 15th. I think you were here, Kristen, on this day where there was like a massive, see what happens is they'll, they'll hold mass or they'll hold a peaceful protest in front of the construction gate and then there are 24 seven between 300 and 500 police stationed off in the corner. And then as the cement trucks pile up and once there gets to be a parade like this, then they'll go remove the protesters and then let the cement trucks in. Because if they're constantly fighting with the protesters, you really lose a lot of your um, strength if you're the police. And it's more, I guess, expedient for them to wait for the cement trucks to pile up and then let them through. And the goal of the protesters is to delay construction. And again, this is just like super fairy because delay construction delays profit. And actually what happened was they delayed the profit, they delayed the construction and profit so successfully that um, the cement company pulled out of the renewal of their contract because there's too much delay, we're not making our money. So delay, delay, delay. And they ended up delaying $58 million worth of construction just by these little increments of delay. And they will just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it anytime, anything they can do. It's costing the government so much money because this is 24 seven around the clock police patrol. I mean, the, uh, the, the costs of it must be incredible. And putting them up in hotels, they rotate the cops from Seoul every two weeks so they don't get to know any of the protesters and get sympathetic with them so they can always be fresh and mean. Here's another, this is what it looks like in the wintertime. This is from last year. And these are all typical sites, people getting pulled out of, this guy, they call him Father Cement Mixer because he, his thing is to get up into cement mixers. <laughs> the woman here, her name is Hyun Acha. She was a National Assembly member, which is like their Congress, from Jeju. She chained herself to a container that was in the access road going to the base construction and blocking them from putting the fence. This was back last fall. For three months, she sat in this spot with chains. In February of this year, 3,500 uh, Anglican priests came down from the mainland and held a mass to protest the base. Around that same time, these 27 nuns got arrested. This woman was outside of the um, governor's office praying um, to stop the base. Oh, by the way, that the woman who's holding her is a plainclothes policewoman. This is the, ma the mayor of Gangjong getting arrested, getting arrested. This is an activist crying after his arrest. This is him in jail. He was in jail for three or four months after that. This is what the base looked like in September from my hotel window. These are people from the Save Our Seas team, which is the aquatic faction of the activists. Um, they are scaling this lattice work of barbed wire that they've covered the coast with. There's more people from Save Our Seas. Here they are again. Um, they made kayaking illegal, recreational kayaking, because of the Save Our Seas. So what we see here is the um, port from which kayaks launch. And in the middle, there's a Howley guy from France that they deported, but this is before he got deported. And he and some other Koreans, some Korean villagers, are trying to take a kayak out. And they got instantly surrounded by several hundred police. 
These um, activists are going out to give moral support to a young 26-year-old man named Kim Dong-hwan, who you can see him about one-fourth up the crane. It looks like a little dot. And he climbed up there to stop the coral dredging, because this, they, this, this is a machine that dredges coral, because it has to be dredged out in order to accommodate the USS George Washington aircraft carrier, which is larger than any Korean aircraft carrier, and one of the arguments that the Korean government gives to its people is that this is for our, this is our sovereignty, this is our base. Well, then why is it that there was a memo from PACCOM asking that this base be deep enough to accommodate the USS George Washington? Anyway, what happened with Dong Wan was he managed to get the coral dredging delayed because when he was arrested, he pointed out many, many environmental infractions. But he was put in jail for about three months, several months, but he, he was recently released. He was very happy about what he achieved because to have a delay of somewhere in the range of four or five days, that's an enormous amount of money lost. Any bit that they can get delay, it's a victory and they're happy to go to jail to earn that. These are um, archaeological sites that were discovered while the construction was going on of a 4,000 year old village that one of the guys from Seoul who's an who runs the archaeological museum said it's one of the most important discoveries in Korea because the um, Civilization's very old there, but they, the government says, well, it's not that important, so just go ahead and, and build over it. Also, there's countless burials in this area. And um, going back very recently, like going all the way from 4,000 years ago to like 50 years ago, countless. That's like a dredging barge. This is the impact of the construction dust on the tangerine crop. This is the um, women's farmers raising hell. <laughs> and um, there's Mi Kyung. She's my, she's my favorite. She helped me so much in explaining Tomna, um, culture, food, language. Um, sacred sites, and oh, okay, so this, right before the, the WCC, which is the big environmental conference, these guys, and Kristen was part of this, they went on what they called the Grand March for Life and Peace, and that was a six-day march in the hot summer sun. It gets very hot, like really hot, um, around the perimeter of the island. Two, two, two groups went around and then they met in the capital, which is exactly across the other side of the island. And along the way, you know, they're campaigning and informing people because there's no freedom of speech. So to get the message out, you have to just go to people. And so they went and they marched and they told everybody what's going on in Gangjung. And then at the end, it culminated in a massive concert um, in Jeju City, the capital city of the island. They're so organized, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and yet, none of this is reported in the mainstream news, and it's massive. Okay, so um, here's a scene out of the World um, Conservation Congress, and it was very scary. Uh, did I mention that Sung Hee, oh, I was talking to someone earlier. Sung Hee, the one, one of the first people to get the word out because she's Korean and she was like sending in dispatches on her blog as to what's going on and that's how I first found out about it and people started to find out about it through her. And so she's a well-known activist against the base. So she and the mayor, who you saw earlier, who's to her left, um, they were invited, but they still had to pay $600 admission to come and each to come and speak at this conference. And um, this particular event was supposed to be limited to 12 people, but once word got out,
that they were speaking and also what was going on with the bass, we filled the whole room. And it was very, very moving because up until that time, the oppression and lockdown at the con convention center was just like unbelievable. S SWAT teams, they, th Sung Hee was on her way, the day before, Sung Hee was on her way into the convention center. She got jumped by 20 police women, women who grabbed off the badge to get her in that she paid $600 for. So she couldn't even get in. So that morning, we were supposed to go do, the next morning we were supposed to go do this event that I had been sort of prepping for and I sort of organized it. And I call her and I go, okay, Sung Hee, are you ready? The lawyer, you know, and she's like, I'm not going. And the mayor's not going. I'm like, why? They, she was terrified because the day before she got jumped by the cops. And she's like, I've just, she already was in jail last year because she held up a sign that said, um, no Navy base at a UN conference at, um, in, in this, right, like a hotel away from this convention center. And she's like, forget it, I'm not going. And then I called the lawyers. We had some lawyers, I can get into that, but um, we had some advocacy there from Chicago. And I said, you have to do what you can to get these guys in. And so they called Sung Hee and Mayor Kong and said, listen, we're gonna come to the village, we'll pick you up, we'll stick you in the car, we'll surround you so that you don't, so that you get in safely. And we were so, they were so nervous. And the thing that blew everyone's mind was after all of that physical violent threat, there was so much love flowing from the international community. And when they told their stories, I was, tears were streaming down because it was like we struggled so hard and then they were just pouring out their stories. Uh, it was intense. Outside of the conference, this sort of, you know, we had our activists, after we got past the initial, and I can tell you the story of that if you're interested, but there was a lot of resistance by the IUCN to let anybody in because the um, uh, Korean government paid IUCN $21 million to come and have the conference. So basically they signed a contract saying they wouldn't let any activists in, they wouldn't let them within a two kilometer radius of the convention center, and, and, and but, but this whole, once word got out, there was this huge uprising within the IUCN between the 1% of the people who got paid off and the 99% who are the well-meaning environmentalists who comprise the membership. And because they were all threatening to quit, they had to, they had to um, start allowing the activists to be heard. And this is outside and in the theater. Um, we got, Mayor Kong was um, invited and Sung Hee was translating to speak uh, after a film screening by Toby McLeod, who did a film about indigenous people and sacred sites all around the world. Emmett Aluli and Hawaii and Kaha Olave are part of this film. Do you remember the name of the film, Terry? Does anyone? Is it Sacred Lands? I think it's called Sacred Lands. Sacredlands.org, and so after that, he invited um, the villagers to come up, and the villagers like came up, and they had they had built this, they had printed up this huge banner, and, but the whole bummer of it was his whole event had be had been sabotaged by the IUCN leadership, so nobody showed up at this event, and the reason it got sabotaged was that. Once the IUCN leadership found out that they couldn't hold back the Gangjung villagers and they had to let them in and they were going to be showing at Toby's screening which was set up to house 3,000 people were expected to be there a half hour before the screening on all the TV monitors all over this five-story convention center it said free food and drinks in the garden in half an hour and everybody went down there and nobody went to the film and so like 10 people saw this amazing display, and then there was also a musical, Tomna musical performance and everything. But it was like this total fight for, to have voice and then to oppress. The whole way through this conference it was unbelievable. 
Okay, so after the conference, the thing about the Gangjung villagers is they never quit. So after the conference was their Thanksgiving, it's their harvest festival called Chuseok, and then after that, as soon as that ended, we're going on the Grand March for Life and Peace to Seoul. So they walked from, they went across in the ferry, and then they walked from the southern tip of the peninsula all the way to Seoul, Korea, to, to the capital, which is pretty near the DMZ, the border with North Korea. And along the way, I mean, these people are sophisticated because they're so down to earth and from the heart. So they gathered support from people striking at this factory and people who had been displaced by this base and farmers who could no longer sell rice because of the imports through FTA, free trade agreement, from California rice and people who had lost their land because they built a rivers project and flooded their land out and farmers couldn't farm anymore. They went everywhere, wherever they went, they walked and they told everybody about what was going on with the base. And so here they are at a temple. Here they are in the rain. See, they're so exuberant. Here they are through, this, I, this is not Seoul, this, but this is a city. They went through country, they went through city, they went through sunny, they went through rain, they camped out, they walked the length of their country collecting people along the way till they got to Seoul and had a 5,000 people strong rally. None of this was reported in the media. It is totally repressive. It was unbelievable. The, the, the government has no interest whatsoever in the people's voice. Meanwhile, because so many of the villagers had gone on this grand march, it left the people in the village who were defending the base and making the delays very scant. There weren't very many people there. So, and not only that, the, that's at the time where the police went from being like 10 hours a day to 24 hours a day. So they were, the police and the construction companies were taking advantage of this grand march. Like they're weak now, we're gonna like move in and we're gonna do some building. And they started doing construction 24 seven around the clock construction. So you can see they're scared of something because otherwise why are they like fighting, fighting, fighting to do this construction? And so here these guys are sleeping, um, you know, mocking the base at three in the morning with cops everywhere. Like I don't know how you could get a good night's sleep. Here's Sung Hee again sleeping and this surprised me because everybody kind of has a job. Some people, like I'm sort of behind the scenes international organizer. Kristen is like in front of the gate yelling. Sunki was a computer person and I was really surprised to see her at three in the morning sleeping in front of the gate because what that told me was that they had really lost a lot of their forces um, uh, in terms of the delays of the trucks. Then they started putting rocks in front of the gate. And this was about a week and a half ago. Carrying boulders, and then the cops would come and pull them away, and then they would come and put the boulders, and then the cops would pull them away. See, there's cops pulling them away. They also at this period brought in some uh, very low wage Vietnamese workers who within a week of arriving started protesting the con work conditions because they're used to a tropical country and it was really cold there. It was really hard for them to sleep in the really cold containers. So the Gangjung villagers always thinking of new ways to organize printed up this banner that said, I think it says, you know, we love our home too. We love our home as much as you, no Navy base on, in Gangjong, in Vietnamese. And also at that time, a lot of Korean workers were laid off because they were replaced by the Vietnamese and I think there was a sort of a labor dispute. That's it. So, um, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, what is the status of that scientific report? Has it been published? It's available online. That's all. And actually, um, I'm trying to. Well, you can take the mic with you so we can pick that oh, up. Oh, okay. 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 A lot of my time.
time right now is like doing everything I can to get Emo able to see her parents again because I feel like responsible since she was not an activist. She was totally apolitical. She was actually very pro South Korean government. Now she's not at all. She went through a transformation like everybody does in um, who visits Gangjung. And um, I was like, yeah, you have to come, you have to come, you, you know, and she got super into it. We got, because we, we went, 15 years ago we met, because I used to run the slow food convivium in San Francisco, and she called me and she was like, you know, she's a rich doctor in Marin, and she's like, oh yeah, let's do slow food. And so we'd go traveling and we, you know, we're like, we had this very exuberant thing. Well, she, she approached activism the same way, and now she can't see her family again, and I feel totally responsible because she sort of took my lead so I'm just doing everything I can to get her, uh, like if, she, if we didn't have her deportation to deal with and getting her to see her family again, we would concentrate more on getting the, the report the, more um, out there. But we have been communicating with a lot of international biologists about it that we met at um, the environmental conference. Yeah. Right. So I was curious in your article, you mentioned deportification. What exactly is the population of the island and how is it extending itself? Are there increasing farms? Okay, the island has been very, very rapidly developed. So the population is, it's either one million or two million. I can't remember. Okay, and um, because it's been so rapidly developed, like since 1990, is when these started, to, they made an announcement, we're now going to have hotels in 1990. And actually, one 23-year-old young man named Yong Yang Chan self-immolated himself in protest. And as a result of this, there was a huge uprising in Jeju-do, Jeju Island, saying, we want the rights of us islanders to have our, um, access to our, our resources, our natural resources. We demand that you preserve the X amount so that it will always be for us to use for our food. And so the national government gave them that. And it's called the, um, I can't remember the exact name, Culture, uh, something like permanent preservation area. It comes by many names because it's all translations of Korean, but something like permanent preservation area. So this space is part of that, and they overturned that. So there's a huge um, uprising about that because it means that that boy's suicide was in vain, and they're, uh, they're terribly upset about that. But getting back to your question, because it's been so quick, it hasn't been thorough. And there are many people that still do the farming and fishing as they always had, because 1990 wasn't a long time ago. The people are still doing that. And then wherever they got displaced and built a hotel, well, they're not doing it there. And people are now turning to you know, capitalism as their way of making a living, which is basically being you know, servants for, Samsung basically owns all the stores and all the mini marts and all the gas stations. and. It's, it's pretty much a, almost a one-man show, Samsung and Hyundai. And um, so now they're workers, you know, service personnel for the hotels, or they're farmers, or they're henio, or they're doing the things they've done for thousands of years. So it's a very interesting hodgepodge, side by side, because right now is the time the shift is happening, big time, cataclysmically. Why the U.S. military has had a substantial presence in Korea for you know, since the 1953 or 1948, and, and still I believe has roughly 30,000 plus troops. Mm -hmm. there. Why did they choose Jeju Island as a place for this new base? And it may be difficult to quantify because I assume there was no plebiscite. What percentage of the population could you estimate is opposed to it? Because you said some were in favor. 
Because I said what? You said some were in favor of the. Oh, well, much of the continental um, Korean population is for it because they have no. <laughs> my, my father's third wife lives there, and I was talking to my stepbrother, and I sort of fessed up. Yeah, I'm going down to protest the base. And he's like, well, I want the base. And he's about 25. And he goes, why? And, or, or, and, I, and, and, I, and, and he said, I, no, no, he said, I want the base. And then I go, why? And then he says, because I want to bomb Japan. And I'm like, why? And he said, because of Dokdo Island, because they're having a dispute over these islands. And I just thought, oh my god, that's so dumb. Because aside from the fact of just like it's dumb to bomb someone, especially who's like right next door, it's like he obviously doesn't get that like the US has orchestrated Japan's military and our military and, the, and, and, and Korea's military and the whole military for that whole region. And Japan's like the biggest ally in the region. And there's no way that they would underwrite the bombing of Japan. But I didn't even get into him with that because he's just like, yeah, we, wanna, we don't want them to take our islands. So so a lot of people are extremely ignorant in the Korean mainland, and they just, you know, there's so much, basically the entire nation and the entire peninsula, North and South, suffers from incredible post-traumatic stress disorder, as do many, many people in Asia from World War II. But they have to live with this um, divided thing. That's their special thing. And, and so it manifests itself in really weird dysfunctional ways. Like you'll hear something and you'll go, oh my god, it's PSTD again. But um, if you want to know why they're um, building the base in Chechedo, it's because um, the US, you know, we are very weak economically now. So, and China's gaining in strength and they're very strong economically. What can we do? Well, we can, we can build more military <laughs> and we can just build more arms and we can just become a bully because how else, because we're sort of like, that's what's going on. So in November of last year, Obama, Secretary of State Clinton, and the head of the Pentagon, Leon Panetta, announced something called the Pacific Pivot, which you may have heard of, which has to do with the Ospreys coming here, which has to do with the Guam buildup. And basically, the idea is to beef up our military in the Far East in order to contain China, which is so interesting because the word containment came out of the Cold War because we were containing communism. And so now we're going to, and it's the thing that, about that word containment is it acts like they're the ones getting out of their borders. They need to be contained. We're all over the place containing them. It's just so, like, ass backwards. So if you look at the map, it's, it, well, actually, that's not a really good map. But if you look at the map, Korea, if you, like, pretend there's no borders, Korea's a peninsula that actually is one side of a big bay. And China's the other side of the bay. And at the bottom of that peninsula is Jeju Island. Now. The place that the aircraft carrier that just got built by the Chinese is going to be ported almost at the top of the bay. So it's so near. It's only 300 miles away from China. So we're actually encircling China with these Aegis missiles that are being tested in Kauai. And so it's going to be, the, the, we've got Aegis missile stationed in Singapore, the Philippines, Australia, Korea, Japan, are there any in Guam? I'm not sure. Probably, because Guam has everything. Um, did you read that article about the Ospreys going to Guam? <laughs> and like the politicians there are like hopeless and they're like, what, they're not dangerous. They're so dangerous, okay. Um, but that's the strategy of the Pacific Pivot, is to encircle and contain China. And so it's perfect geostrategically. What, what, what kills me is that in doing so, these people's homes are being sacrificed for a superpower thousands of miles away who can't invest in its own education, health care, and economy, is going down the tubes. And how does it react? by putting all its money into containing China because China's doing so well. And also, you know, 
Bruce Gagnon, who I mentioned before, who's head of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, said that um, the sea routes that go through like the Moleccan Straits, the Strait of Taiwan, and um, through Taiwan, these, all the oil supply for China goes through here. So whoever controls these seas in the East China Sea controls China. But think about it. Our oil doesn't come from there. Why are we so focused on over there? Well, I'll tell you, we did a lot of outsourcing of our companies who are now in China. And so we're protecting. The, the reason why we're so interested in the national security over there is because our companies who left us high and dry with no jobs in the United States are over there hiring cheap labor. So we have to keep it secure over there. Kristen? Could you talk um, um, a little bit um, as well how um, Jeju came to be uh, known as the Peace Island and the apology that was delivered not that long ago for the disaster that happened in 1948? Yeah. Because it was the Red Island. Um, just a little bit. Yeah. Well, Sasam, which means three, four, um, or 4-3, um, April 3rd, it was a notorious date in the psyches of all Jeju Islanders, even though it wasn't just one day, but um, a course of several months that there was this intense massacre where the South Korean government, on orders from the U.S. military, massacred 30,000 Jeju Islanders because they refused to take a stance f for or against South or North Korea. And as a result, they were labeled communists. And keep in mind, late 40s, 50s, this was the height of McCarthyism. This was, it, it's so weird because you, even I was talking to Sue Sun and she organized an event here in Hawaii that examined the Korean War and the Korean community here, who's still embedded with this kind of propaganda, Cold War propaganda, it's frozen in them, labeled her a communist, like red baiting. And it's like, dude, it's like the 21st century. And it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like they're frozen in this and they take it very, very seriously. Well, back, so, so these people were massacred because they didn't take a stand one way or the other and they were labeled communists. And so the US commander said to the South Korean commander, kill everyone you see in sight because they're communists. They're communists, they gotta go. So as a result of this gut-wrenching pain that people just didn't talk about to only very recently because they were dying, and you've got to make sure that history gets passed on, so finally they're coughing up this stuff. They um, started to talk about it, and a really great president named President Roe, and I can't remember his first name because there's two President Roes. There's a really, do you remember which one? This is a good one. Roe Muhyun. He um, gave a public apology to the people of Jeju, and he said, we are going to call this Peace Island now. And that's how it got the name in 1991 as Peace Island. Before that, it was Woman's Island. And um, people took that seriously. They took that as uh, an authentic apology. So now that the Navy base is happening, it's like, how can you do this? So anyway, thank you, everyone.
dual purpose port. Uh, it's it's going to be a, it's going to be a green port. It's going to be um, uh, environmentally friendly. Anyway. Anyway. Um, and it's going to be a dual purpose port. There will be tour ships that come in, and that will be good for your economy and good for your village. Well, now they've revised that to state that it's not going to be a, a dual purpose port, but um, those of us who know better know that uh, it's, it was just a, a, a really deceitful, manipulative ruse um, by the South Korean, Korean government to... Um, to garner support. There has never been a cruise ship berthed next to a warship. I mean, who wants to spend the money to go on a cruise to, ne to wake up next to a nuclear submarine? I mean, it's, you know, but so anyway, and, and they're also blaming the fact that the tour ships would have to be so many thousands of tons, um, and that that's why uh, they use that to justify the extent of the dredging, some of the dredging of the soft coral. So these people have just been lied to, uh, you know, again and again and again, and it's. And so a lot of the Jeju people um, believed that, but because of the Grand March and getting the word out, you know, now most of the Jeju people have come around to the other side. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah, I, I, I obviously I said there wasn't a club site. You mentioned 94% of the village. Yes. And you also said that you know, there were a million people living there. Yes. So I was wondering, I was wondering if it was possible to quantify oh, the amount of opposition. To not precisely, but you know, in the beginning it was 50-50, and oh. now it's more people going against the base because the villagers are so successful in their campaign. Mm -hmm. But even so, it's such an impressive government that we still, they're just blasting through, come hell or high water. But I think high water might win. Thanks. Thank oh, great. Hello. I used to work at Hoiike. So thank you, Kuhan, and thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you for um, asking your questions and listening attentively. Uh, we did have Olelo taping this evening, so eventually we're going to be able to get a, a capture of some of this information to be able to share more widely. Please um, wander past the snacks that are still here. Please take a moment especially to come and see some of the materials that you might want to take with you and to, to see the, the maps that are available. You have more questions, yeah? In the light of reverence. And featured four, I believe, four different cultures, and then the one that he's working on now is well. The, the, the one that Toby McLeod of Sacred Lands is working on now. Um, I don't recall the name of it, but it does feature eight. It will feature eight different sacred lands from around the world, and the eighth, the last one, will be Koholabe, which will be held up as. Um, as a model of uh, uh, a little bit farther along. You know, the struggles will be in, in different, um, different stages of the struggle for, you know, whatever the issues around the sacred lands, and Koho'olabe will be held up as, as the last one, as having, a, you know, had some accomplishments. That's all right, thank you. No, thank you for coming back with that information. That's good for us to, to have. Thank you all. Good evening.